Welcome aboard the USS Aeronome. To become a member of our crew, please visit perfectorganism.com slash support. As a patron of Perfect Organism, you'll receive exclusive perks and early access to content. Incoming audio transmission received. Please proceed to Subdeck 3 to begin playback. Thank you, and welcome aboard. I think we ought to discuss the bonus situation. Right. Brett and I, we think we ought to, we deserve full shares, right, right baby? You see, Mr. Park and I feel that the bonus situation is... Move! Get out of there! Why you move? Dad! Move, Dad! Move, Dad! Get out! Welcome to Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga Podcast. I am your host, Dan Prater, and I'm joined by my co-host... Patrick Green, my friend. Very excited about this one. Yeah, and today we are here interviewing Scott Sigler and to talk about your book, Alien Phalanx. <laughs> Aliens yes. Phalanx, right? Alien, alien, <laughs> alien, fa- alien, <laughs> colon, I mean, I, I, I was going through it, like, on my way home from work. I was like, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to fuck this name up, and I, of course I did. Alien <laughs> Phalanges. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me on the show. I'm excited. Alien phallus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been, it's such a treat getting to read, um, you know, this advanced copy of this book. It is wildly unexpected and so suffused with world building and interesting ideas. And there's so much for fans to explore here. Um, we're going to be try. we're going to try to be very careful not to spoil anything um, on this, on this podcast as it's coming out right around the release date, which is the 25th of February. Um, so uh, pick it up if you have not already. You can pre-order it on Amazon and elsewhere. And uh, Scott, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. This yeah, is exciting. Thank you so much. So you you have uh, a, a fascinating career trajectory, I have to say. In, in reading up on your past um, for the show, one of the things that I, I saw that I was most struck by was you kind of invented the, the podcast novel format. Mm-hmm. Um, among other things, you have you know the Earth Core series, a number of like long um, uh, trilogies of works and things like that, and a whole sort of like inbuilt fan base in your whole sort of Sigler verse, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. can you give us a little bit of, uh, of a background on what you do, where you come from, what some of your works might be, and how people can find out more about what you do? Well, uh, I'm on all the social medias as Scott Sigler, S-C-O-T-T-S-I-G-L-E-R. Uh, pretty active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, Facebook is facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. ScottSigler.com is there, but people don't really actually use their own websites for anything anymore. It seems to have gone away. But uh, uh, we started out, um, three people sort of came up with the idea of releasing a full-length novel as serialized fiction via podcast about the same time. That was... Um, Mark Jeffrey with a book called The Pocket Independent and T. Morris with one called Moravi and myself with uh, Earthcore. And we all wound up on the Dragon Page podcast, which used to be a syndicated radio show, and they went into podcasting. And they started sharing all three of those books while we were simultaneously sharing it as well. Um, this was when Lost was out and uh, 24 was a big show. So the the Western audiences were sort of newly were reintroduced to long form cliffhangery serialized fiction and Earthcore wasn't out as a book at all and uh, moravi was in the pocket pen where you could go buy the book but Earthcore, you got uh you got your weekly episode and then you had to wait for the next week and that sort of drove people a little bit crazy waiting for their next episode and i was i have a marketing background i was in marketing at the time so i was able to share those links on message boards dig.com all, all over the place and was encouraging people, if you like this, share this. And it was one of those things, you know, you're able to share it with people who like kind of the same things you like and do that at the speed of light and it spread pretty quick. So we wound up at one point, we had like 40,000 weekly listeners for Earthcore. Uh, and this was heady time because I'd been trying to get published for 13 years or so and gone through all the normal channels, sending manuscripts to agents and publishers, going to conventions and uh, getting a ton of rejection letters. 
And I always felt if I could get somebody to put it on a shelf, I, I thought my stuff would sell. And they were hesitant to pick it up because it was cross genre, which at the time was a bad thing. So they like, is this military? Is this sci-fi? Is this thriller? It had all these different, Earthcore had all these different elements to it and wasn't able to get published. And then put out Earthcore, got all those fans, wound up putting out the second podcast book I put out called Ancestor that got picked up by a small imprint. And when we put out Ancestor as a trade paperback, uh, and this was before eBooks, that's how old I am. This is before eBooks. It was number one in horror and number one in sci-fi on Amazon and number two fiction overall behind one of the Harry Potter novels. So this is from somebody no marketing budget, nobody had ever heard of me. And the New York publishers were very interested when they saw this happen because that was something they couldn't do at the time. And that was leveraging the podcast audience. And these people were getting my stuff free every week. Like, hey, go pick up a copy on April 1st. And uh, we kind of bum rushed the charts there. And by getting that big ranking on Amazon, that wound up leading to a five book deal with Random House. And we lot of, let off with a book called Infected, which is book one of the Infected trilogy. And that did pretty well. And the second book, Contagious, hit the New York Times bestseller list. And we've just been on a roll since then. Um, that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We still give away fiction every week over at scottsigler.com or go to iTunes and search for my name, Scott Sigler, Scott Sigler Audiobooks. We dump like 20 to 30 minutes of um, unabridged fiction every week. And we hope to continue. We're on, we're on 16 years now, something like that. It's pretty ridiculous. So we hope to continue doing that as long as we can. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit, certainly to me, but also the audience, what a podcast book is. Because I'm not familiar with that, like what that sure. actually, what that process entails. Basically, it's real simple. You take an audiobook, you chop it up into say 20 or 30 pieces, depending on length. And then the author will introduce that week's episode say, this is what's coming up. Usually the author uh, gives inside baseball information. Here's what's going on in my career. Here's what's going on in my life. A lot, I like a lot of podcasts. And then people make that connection with that human being sharing their life and, and the, the sound of that person's voice. Then you play the episode. And then at the end of the episode, you kind of tease like, hey, here's what's coming up next week. Here's some here's some teasers for the next episode. So it's just like, it's exactly like Lost, exactly like 24, exactly like any show that you just release episodically. It's changed a lot because now streaming and the concept of Netflix is you don't have to wait. You get the whole thing at once. So you want mainline three seasons of Daredevil? You can do that, you know, all at once. But that is pretty much what a, we used to call it a podcast novel. And then um, NPR came out and kind of once the, once the podcasting technology was established and there was an audience, NPR kind of swooped in and started releasing their shows on as RSS as podcasts. And then eventually they went on to do Serial, which is one of the big breakout podcasts. So now when I describe to people what I do with a podcast, it's a serialized audiobook or a serial audiobook. By and large, it's, it's exactly the same audiobook you could get in any store which is part of the selling proposition for what I do. Why do I give the stuff away free? Well, now when I release a, no a podcast novel, episode one is free and the whole thing is free. It's unabridged. You get the whole thing if you want to wait 22 weeks to get the whole story. If you can't stand it, you want to go buy it, you can go buy it. So we kind of, uh, in this game, we leave it up to the listener. If you can wait and be patient, get the whole thing for free. If you love it and you want to go buy it, you can do that too. Mm, clever. Yeah. Which is how the fan base... <laughs> How my fan base started to refer to themselves as junkies because they were waiting for their for their 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 hit every week. Earth core became Earth crack. They were waiting for the hit every week. They were junkies, <laughs> and, and, and I still have fans who like even if I some if I putting out a book they've already heard via Audible or bought, they'll still listen every week because you get that you get that awesome connection with the creator. And oftentimes I'm the one reading the book myself, so it really establishes a deeper connection than most authors are able to get with their audience. So that format's been extremely beneficial to me to create those 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 true fans who who consume everything I put out. And uh, we have, we've developed a great culture, great relationships. Uh, Scott's going to come without, before Facebook, we had 14,000 people on that site, people active there every day, talking to each other. We've lifelong friendships have come out of that from people uh, that I never even met that made each other. That rolled into a thing we do called Sigler Fest. We did that for nine years in a row in Vegas where all the fans come out and hang out like a little mini con. Uh, and it's, it's fa fabulous. And a lot of that culture has transferred over into Facebook, which is now where most people are. I love how this is such like the bright side of the internet that we're getting to talk about. I feel like we spend so it much is. time just <laughs> complaining about how evil everything is online. And well, this my, is something that, you know, we, 
my business partner is her name is A Kovacs, and we decided when we started this show a long time ago, back in two thousand five, two thousand six, and she kind of came on board in two thousand eight, I think. Uh, we're full, we're fifty fifty partners in what Empty Set Entertainment, which is our company. Um, we decided right off the bat that we this is going to be a happy place. This is a place for escapism, and we rode herd on politics and you know any anybody getting marginalized, people being frankly being assholes. You know, we'd give people a warning at scottsigo.com, like that's not how we behave here. This is a fun spot. We're going to keep this to be a fun thing. Um, if you want my opinion on this president or that president, you're going to have to go somewhere else to get it because we're not doing that here. And it it really caught on. And even though we have a lot of fans in the space who are extremely opinionated uh, about a lot of things, they leave that at the door when they are on uh, facebook.com slash Scott Sigler on scottsigler.com or in a real hardcore group of fans on Facebook called Sigler Junkies which is a, a closed group. Um, and we're, we're actually, we're, we're really proud of that. Some authors are very prominent activists, left or right, and use their um, bully pulpit, if you will, to get up and, and talk about all the things they find important. We feel like you can get that information in a lot of different places. What you can't get in a lot of places is, is pure fiction. It's really fun and interact with other people who love fiction and try and keep that space troll free. And and if you and if you write well enough, which which you do, I think that you can pull out from it sort of like a Rorschach test. What you know is, is what what you actually are seeing in the material and getting from it in a more mm-hmm. organic sense and kind of being preached to or reading something that reveals itself to be polemical after you get far enough along into it, which is really great. But it's funny we uh, just had our, our five year uh, anniversary retrospective. Oh, congratulations! This, this previous one, thank you. Um, it's most, mostly Jamie. He was here before I was. <laughs> um, but it was another moment where we were just kind of remarking on the organic growth of the community around this podcast and, and fandom mm-hmm. and how the internet does have this capacity to really bring people together in a way that's not always uh, damaging. And I think that um, I'm glad that this this whole Siglerverse thing has just been such a wonderful community. I think it's just incredible. And I think it's so neat that we're coming back to these storytelling tr- ideas like, you know, the serialized novel was such a, that was like how a lot of fiction was published for hundreds of years, right? Yes. And then it's yes. like the 20th century came along, the publishing houses clamped down and everything. Mm-hmm. And then now we're seeing this growth of like real fiction springing up, just like what Jamie's writing too, on the internet, sort of finding its own place and then and then convincing publishing companies that this is a viable new thing and the audiences want to see new storytelling formats. And that's why we're seeing this renaissance, I think. Um, before we get too much more into that, though, just briefly, I want to go back a little bit. Uh, something you do in the novel, which... Um, is a, very much not a spoiler, is right at the beginning, you have a note to the reader. Yes. And that's something that immediately caught me off guard because I haven't really seen that in a long time. And I'm wondering if you wanted to maybe read a, a, a little bit of that or kind of give a little bit of sure. thinking on it. Yeah, uh, I will. Uh, I'll read it out loud, uh, I have a book in front of me, and then I will give you my thinking on that. It's titled, A Plea From Me, The Author, To You, The Reader. No spoilers. We live in an interconnected world. Everything you put online, from a blog post to reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, to a YouTube comment, to a simple tweet, is instantly visible to other readers interested in the same kind of books you are. I have worked hard to craft a compelling story with what I hope are some unexpected twists. If you choose to discuss Aliens Phalanx online, please be courteous to your fellow readers and avoid mentioning these surprises. Those of us who love reading know there is only one chance to enjoy a book for the first time. Those of us who adore the Aliens franchise get precious few moments to discover new elements of this enduring universe. Whether you love or hate this book, I encourage you to tell people how you feel about it, but please consider the enjoyment of others. Avoid posting spoilers and let people experience this story for themselves. And they say thank you and sign my name. So um, it's, it's so frustrating, even in this day of immediate gratification on Netflix where you can go get the whole series. Let's let's keep talking about Daredevil, if you will. Daredevil comes out. It's awesome. You can't get to it for a while. You're busy, stuff with the kids, stuff with work. You got working on your own creative projects, etc. Like I'll watch that later. And then if you're on Twitter at all, all of these spoilers constantly show up. And it it if you are the kind of person who likes to experience stuff for yourself, it really sucks the fun out of it. I mean I think it was uh you know Game of Thrones I'm on the West Coast and so Game of Thrones tweets were coming out from the East Coast for the last few seasons. And it was super frustrating. Like I have to turn off my computer for three hours just to be able to enjoy this show. So this is a concept of getting out front and just trying to remind people, yes, you may absolutely hate Aliens Phalanx and think Scott's a horrible writer. That's totally cool. Talk about that, but try to avoid those things that other people might find uh, enjoyable. That's where we're going with that. So 
let's talk about your history with the franchise and how did this happen and essentially where the story came from. I mean, we can get to that point, but uh, oftentimes with writers or you know people who direct films, you can see their influences like, hey, mm-hmm. where maybe their film feels a little bit more like the original or it feels more like um, the sixth film or the first film or, or whatever. Um, so I'm curious where you, where your place where you pivoted from when you were like, okay, here I am. I'm about to write a story. This is what I love about the Alien franchise. Well, first of all, Aliens is far and away my favorite movie. Uh, I think it's the best movie ever made. Best action movie by far. I'm a huge fan. I've watched it, I think, I'm like 86 times through watching the movie. Um, it's very annoying to watch that movie with me because like a lot of Aliens fans, I'm quoting all the dialogue as it's, as it's said. And it's not just that I love the movie. It had... It is the single biggest influence on my work as an author. I'm not really influenced by other books. I am to some degree, but I'm much more influenced by movies, TV shows, and my writing. I'm trying to, I'm basically trying to show you a big budget summer blockbuster in every one of my books. So it has a similar pacing style to that. James Cameron's Aliens introduced me to the concepts of overlapping tension arcs. So we're going up with this tension arc and it's coming down. But before it finishes, a new tension arc has already started and you never really get a chance to take a breath or relax all the way. And that uh, first time I saw it, I was like, that's amazing. And it's been incorporated into all my work. So Alien, Aliens are an amazing one-two punch. And um, when I started talking to Steve Saffle at Titan, I can't quite remember if he, I think he said asked what I would like to do or he knew I was a giant aliens fans and he brought the idea to me. We were, I just started writing up. uh, I was so excited. I just started writing up different story ideas of stuff I had always wanted to see in, uh, in the universe. And I wrote a story called bug hunt, uh, excuse me, in, in aliens bug hunt, I wrote a story called dangerous prey. And that is the, I remember that one. Yeah, that, that was super fun. That is, I believe the first story told completely from a xenomorph point of view um, and gained a lot of experience working with Fox. They have very specific rules on what they, what they will allow people to see behind the curtain of how the xenomorphs work. But I, inve- I did a ton of research and had a couple of PhDs helping me with insect communication. And then veterans taught with small unit tactics and a lot of stuff like how could, from what we've seen in alien and aliens, and I stopped there, how could I make all of that work biologically and then extrapolate from there. So I was really deep into communicating with Fox already. I knew, had learned a lot about how to interact with them and how to play in their sandbox. Uh, and then when Steve South from Titans, like throw some ideas my way, I, I think I sent five, four or five page treatments, just dumped all of these ideas on him. A lot of cool stuff. And the one he gravitated towards was what we called at the time was Aliens Legion. Um, and that eventually became Aliens Phalanx once I started to research a little bit more about the subject material that winds up bleeding into the book. It's, if there's a lot of controversy over Covenant and Prometheus and the Predator movies and the crossovers, etc. What I can tell your audience is if you liked Alien and Aliens a lot, you're going to love Phalanx. It doesn't run contrary to Covenant or Prometheus or anything like that. There's nothing that says, oh, those things never happen. But it's um, it's it organically follows those two movies pretty specifically. And it fits in really well with uh, Cold Forge by Alex White as well. Which is a wonderful book as well. Um, yeah, love it. Something that it's, it's uh, so, so you said, so you, you were, you were kind of throwing ideas out there to Fox about this or to Titan. This was the Fox initially. It starts out with Titan. You go through, uh, Steve Saffel manages the property for Titan in real, in conjunction with Fox. So Steve will pre-qualify all the ideas and he'll say, well, that, that won't work because of this, or we're doing something similar to that. So go away from that. Then when he gets the key ideas, he will go over to Fox and champion what he thinks will be the best one. So at all times in this process, even though Steve's like, you gave me five ideas, I'm going to show them all to Fox, but this is the one I want. This is the one I'm going to pitch to them. He's doing that knowing full well that Fox might be like, we actually like number three better. And then you wind up going with number three because they're the ones who own the property. So he is the uh, he is the, the keeper of the gates, if you will, over at Titan. Well, the, the reason why I'm asking is because I feel like uh, something that – 
I know I personally have complained about is that although the quality of the writing of the Titan novel, tight, Titan, the Titan novels has been terrific, mm-hmm. um, and and they've they've been really enjoyable reads. I've noticed that they they don't seem to take that many storytelling chances, at least over the last couple of years. They feel yeah. very very in universe and very kind of constrained and very clearly, um, you know, sort of out of the pages of the Brand Bible. And something that is so refreshing about Phalanx, and so and that was also so refreshing about Cold Forge in a, in a different way, but it's in some similar ways is how audaciously different this is from the very beginning because it it tonally it starts on its own note right although like this idea of fear and of being hunted is something that you know fans of the franchise will recognize right away everything else contextually around it is different right and and to me and I know this is something Jamie will speak to as well um something that I found so refreshing about it was that I really was disoriented for a while I really had to sort of stop Sort of, I had to kind of check my reservations a little bit about what I was reading and think like, okay, what is this actually about? Yeah, yeah. And then I could really get the whole the whole scope of it. And I'm just wondering, I guess, for you as a creative person and as an author, um, what what does it feel like to take a chance like that on something that you know is sort of sacred ground for people? And uh, and do you find that liberating or is it terrifying or how does it how does it feel? Were you hoping they was, wouldn't go with that idea? I was n- pretty confident that once they started to gravitate towards this story that I could knock it out of the park. And when you're doing something in the Aliens universe, it basically begins with a binary choice. Are the characters aware of the Xenomorphs? And do they have knowledge of the Xenomorphs? Or is this somehow a brand new thing that they've never heard of before? You know, like uh, River of Pain, for example, you know, the characters know nothing about it. And then some characters later show up who are actually hunting for this. And even aliens, they got an idea that it's out there and they're trying to chase down. But are your key characters aware of the Xenomorphs? Are they not? And those that bifurcates into two very different storytelling styles right out of the gate. So I sort of found what I felt was a middle ground where our characters are aware of demons, as they're called in the book. They're very aware that these things are out there, but the characters are from a culture that doesn't have any context for what these things are or where they came from. Uh, and that that was the storytelling chance that I took. And it, it, I think it paid off pretty good because if you do your job correctly as a writer, you make the reader feel like they are side by side with the main characters. And if I've done my job right, the you are kind of, even though you already know, if you're an Aliens fan, Everything you see in Aliens Phoenix, you already know this stuff. You know all the biology, you know all the background, but you're experiencing it anew from the perspective of the characters. So hopefully that's a challenge I accomplished. Every time the, 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 like you you uh, hear the characters grappling with the knowledge they have or don't have of the demons and the, and the demons culture, you know, as it were, you're, you have this chance to re-examine your own conceptions. Like you think, oh, the face hugger does look like a spider. Like that's yeah. kind of freaky. And you think like, oh, the queen really is, you know, this like very mysterious creature living in this, you know, black mountain. It's, it's, it, it, it makes everything feel very mythological and very kind of uh, universal. And I, I really enjoyed how you were able to still use the tropes that we've grown so accustomed to yeah but uh make it feel fresh make it feel like it's kind of reinterpreted well it's it, a lot of this comes from like i'm a huge fan of joe abercrombie if you guys haven't read joe abercrombie's books he's a sensationally grim dark dark fantasy kind of a thing and of course george r. r martin and mike cole is another author in that space and peter b brett and uh, the list kind of goes on and on and you read those and fantasy world building which I've never done before, only in small stories, but I've always been a huge fan of it. And watching uh, the wizard behind the curtain, like, oh, I see. Okay, so this is their magic system, you know. Okay, so this is their, this is how they're setting up this history, etc. Getting to do that all from the context of the aliens universe was was really really fun. So what I think people are going to be surprised about by Phalanx is this is a fantasy novel. This is a fantasy novel that happens to have xenomorphs in it. Yeah, and that was. Much like you, Patrick, I initially I was like, okay, I've got to reorient myself here. This isn't the spaceship. This isn't any of the in terms of the the um, the setup that we're used to because mm-hmm. you're always pivoting between either it's a dark grim planet or it's a dark grim spaceship or mm-hmm. it's it's a derelict. Like that's whether it's the books or the or the the movies. Usually you're pivoting from you know the places that you haven't been or maybe the Wayland Yutani offices or wherever those might be. Um, right. So. Pivoting into the world that you create took me a minute, but then all of a sudden you don't even 
you or, or you stop paying attention to it because you're paying attention to character, which is what mm-hmm. that's that's the the goal. A technical question I had for you though, as you know, Fox has merged with Disney, or Disney has essentially bought Fox. They really haven't merged. Mm-hmm. Um, did your when did um you begin your discussions with Fox about your book? Was it pre like I don't know how long it takes to write a book like this. If it was three years ago, two years ago, a year ago. This took about. Um, I'll check with my my business partner. She has a better mind for dates. Um, we started this about. I think the discussion with Steve started about two years ago. Okay. Um, and that was just the initial discussion of of where we're going to go from here and sitting down and having a, a couple of beers and and throwing out ideas. We did that at um, at Dragon Con in Atlanta, so we really started to get down to figuring out how we're going to do this. And it. Um, they had a specific timeline in mind. So if I wanted to do this, I had to address it in X amount of time. I think we started this before the Disney buyout. Uh, and, but we, I mean, it's been seamless on our side. We've had no problems whatsoever. No, no, I, I don't think the people Steve has worked with, I think somebody, one of his contacts left and another person took over, but there hasn't been any issue at all regarding that. It's, but I think top to bottom about two years it took to do the whole process. Awesome. I, I will say uh, in terms of talking about the book and a, a movie that you haven't spoken about is Alien 3. Right away I was conjuring images of Alien 3 because it has that, yeah. it has that um, I don't know, desolate feel, uh, which I love. Um, so mm-hmm. right away, even though I was reorienting myself to the the context of your book, it also felt familiar, which I thought was great. There's some elements of Alien 3 in it. Uh, that's just, you know, there's so much lore and drama behind what that was supposed to be compared to what it turned out as. Mm-hmm. But there's very few properties in the Aliens universe that, like you said, don't involve a spaceship or, you know, the grim dark planet. But the focus on almost all the Alien stories is get to the spaceship, get away from the Xenomorphs, blow up the Xenomorphs. A lot of things largely come down to that wonderful formula, which is always entertaining. But Phalanx, I tried to go with a different route. What if there is no spaceship you can run to? What if there's nowhere to run, period? You're not even aware there is such a thing as as a spaceship. And I think that put a little bit of a different, uh, it puts a different flavor on Phalanx and lets the, the Xenomorph plague play out from a different direction. I want to touch on the whole uh, nowhere to run thing. But before I do, I want to go back for a second, because one of our listener questions was just sort of obliquely referenced accidentally okay. there, which was from Mike Andrews, our good friend, who was asking about Alien 3 and specifically the Vincent Ward um, monastic wooden planet script and mm-hmm. wondering if perhaps that had any kind of influence on this. I feel like it probably did not. But there was something tonally kind of similar about this sort yes. of like ancient society yes. feel going on. So was that in your head at all? When you it were was this? not. It was not. And I've only learned about the the wooden planet after I started writing this and started researching a lot more on stuff. Um, but yeah, that that has come up very commonly on message boards and different and Twitter and different places. People Offensive. asking me if if that because yeah. it not having known about that and people are like oh it's like Alien Three. I'm like it's not like Alien Three at all. And then I <laughs> I research and find out about the monastic order in the wooden planet and I can see why people make that leap. But once you read the book, it doesn't. I don't think it really feels like that at all. And some of that was the fan base just desperate to have a lot of these pieces connect. People want they want a you know, an original universe, if you will, where all of these things actually integrate and work together. Right. And that's, and for, for a property that's this big with so many different creator hands in it, and then so many different executive hands approving or declining what the creators do, it's almost impossible. Like Star Wars uh, collapsed under its own weight and they had to go do something else because it was getting too hard to keep track of it. Aliens has managed to avoid that to some degree, but a lot of it doesn't line up. And I think a lot of the Alien 3 wooden planet where people are like, oh, if this is like that, that would be so cool because we've been waiting for this thing for so long. But there, it's it's pretty different. But I think Very what it has different. in common yeah. with it, I, I think what it, 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 oh, it's totally different, but what it has in common from at least an idea perspective, I think, and part of why Vincent Ward's um, script, is it's it's my favorite unfilmed script ever made. I think it's just brilliant. Okay. Part, something that I love about both of them is just how how atypical it is. And part of that is the absence of technology. Part mm-hmm. of it is this is this world where it's very much based on custom and tradition, and it has its own sort of it speaks its own language, and you kind of have to figure the language out as it goes along. And I think um, it's it's no coincidence that Vincent Ward's script was uh, largely he got the job basically because he had just shot this incredible time travel fantasy through a medieval world, and um, and it was a big hit. And then the and you know so he came with all this like medieval research that he wanted to use um, in a science fiction film, and and he mm-hmm. tried, and it was a little too crazy, and they ended up you know. Actually 
indexing it. Um, but that same kind of that, that, that sort of uh, a technological approach, I think, is really interesting. But to go back to what I bookmarked, this is not without its own technology. There's actually um, really uh, going, you know, sort of to what you learn in the first 30 or 40 pages of the book. There is a, a really um, wonderfully uh, believable atmosphere. You did a lot of research into weapons and how they fit together and how mm -hmm. the spears worked, how the phalanx operates as a unit, how shield training works, etc. And you have these things, these holds that are kind of forming the centerpiece of this of this culture. So something that I'm curious about as a reader is uh, when you're world building, and, and I, I mean literally world building, because when you open the book up, you see a map of, of Adagina, the region where this is unfolding, right? Um, yes. How do those ideas sort of grow? How do you how do you know what direction to take them in? And like, as you're kind of creating this literal world map, and then all of the things that are inhabiting the space, uh, what are some of the things that lead to these decisions? What's that like? It's it's something I've done a few times. I've got a series called the the GFL series of the Galactic Football League series, which is American pro football, 700 years in the future, played um, with with aliens playing different positions based on their physiology. And that has is like the first three books are almost nothing but world building. You have to introduce the reader to this sprawling, sprawling civilization that has a lot of different influences um, and figuring out what to put in. What to leave out is uh, is a dance that all fantasy and sci-fi world building writers have to go through. I knew I wanted to keep the the landmass relatively confined. Um, I knew that I wanted to set up a very believable like th there has to be a reason that the remnants of the human race are cowering in these mountain holds. And I knew the scenes I wanted to portray, and then having fairly encyclopedic knowledge of alien and aliens, I wanted to make sure I didn't betray what we've all come to know in those two movies. So a lot of the world building was how do I set up this structure where we have this many people left alive and how are they avoiding like the perfect organism? How are they avoiding the, the greatest killer of all time? So the world building for me is I will often, I usually come up with a big bang ending like I got the general concept, big bang ending, and then kind of work backwards from there to a normal beginning. So everything seems tame and normal. And then I outline from there. And if I outline correctly, the goal is I, in all my books, in my modern day horror thrillers, uh, the sci-fi books, is to feed you kind of a steady diet of things that you already know. And that builds up a sense of trust. And then as we move into the second act, crazier stuff starts to happen. Uh, and start to take you out of your comfort zone. But we've already got this relationship and me, the author, you, the reader. So you believe what I say. And if I do it correctly, by the time we get to the third act where things just get bonkers, completely over the top, you don't care. You're along for the ride anyways. So the world building then kind of goes in and fleshes out that plot structure so that the things I'm introducing already seem natural and normal and like a living, breathing part of this world. What I, my biggest tactic I use in writing is I try to avoid what I call a speed bump, which is anything where you get reminded that you're reading a book. So it's little things. It can be the same word used twice in a sentence. It can be the same idea expressed at three paragraphs apart. It can be anything where like, wait, what, what is that? What is this thing right here? You have to go back and go back a couple pages and read it. I'm big into an attribution. Uh, I really work hard so that as soon as a quote dialogue begins, you know who's speaking. So you don't finish the quote, then have to go back and reread it with the right voice in your head. And all of those things go into it. World building is another part of that avoiding speed bumps. You want to make sure that you are introducing things very subtly so they already are ingrained in the reader's mind and when they pop up in chapter seven and the bodies start to pile up everything flows perfectly normal and you're just along the ride with the characters speaking of bodies and xenomorphs i'm mm -hmm. curious what is your do you have a, a favorite aspect to uh the creature i mean there's various iterations of it but i was interested as i was reading i was like i wonder what your inroad of course we have the queen which is awesome mm -hmm. that we've seen before but what is it for you that fascinates you about the creature itself what from alien and aliens what has always fascinated me is the the parasite life cycle that this species represents and when we get into movies past those that tends to change a little bit although alien 3 was pretty pretty solid overall from that regard so it's what i as a biology nerd uh, and all of my work is is heavily rooted in real science. Even if it's modern day, people like you and me and going through some crazy stuff, the science is real. I don't do very much supernatural work at all, very little magic in any of my works. So to see a movie like Aliens where 
there's no point in aliens where you're like, okay, minute 52, you're like, wait a minute, they, they can't do that. He told us he couldn't do that back in minute 12. And you're taken out of the story. That never happened because they had the biology locked down really, really well. So that has been the thing that has always fascinated me. And then of course, all the accoutrements that go with it, you know, the acid for blood, you can't kill it. Killing it will kill you is amazing. It's bigger, faster, stronger. And the the taking away of the normal defenses that we have as intelligent sentient beings is where the terror comes from from alien from aliens in alien it was you know haunted house is a creature in, the haunted house just happened to be in space uh, and it's a it's basically a ghost story where the ghosts coming to get you aliens took it to a completely different level introduced this really detailed complex life cycle that's the part that has always fascinated me the most and then to be able to take that and put that into a fantasy environment where you know, we'd all love to be Frost and Hudson and Hicks and tee off in these things from 50 meters out and blow them away. What if you, what if you can't do that? If you got a bow and arrow and you're lucky if the arrow will even hit the thing, let alone penetrate the shell, you're kind of screwed. So that was the most intriguing part of it was working with the biology that we have seen, being true to those two movies and what we were told, and then finding a way to put that into a, a, um, a primitive context and watching our characters deal with it. And that actually uh, relates to another listener question that I wanted to throw okay. out there, which is from our, our dear friend Connor Murdoch. <laughs> Uh, who asks, was it difficult to implement... I, I would do this in a Scottish accent, but I think you would feel really fascinating. <laughs> was it difficult to implement the medieval aspects of the world and characters into the alien universe? Combating aliens with swords seems like suicide, considering their acidic blood. So without spoiling anything, that, that's something that I found really fascinating. Because from the very beginning of this book, you're like, oh my god, they are like really screwed in these encounters. Yep. And of course, the encounters themselves become like a really big deal. Like if you see one of the demons up close, if you witness them... It is, it, it's, it's like a, a big mark of, uh, of, of, you know, fame and glory within the, within this hold, right? Because it's such a, a difficult thing to survive because you're so under, um, under, uh, weaponized. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess I, I'm curious about that too and about how this whole sort of the notion of the phalanx and the notion of the spears and all these different, uh, weapons like mm -hmm. sort of came together and how you reconciled that with these aliens, which are, as mm -hmm. you say, you know, perfect killing machines. It's some of it is things are not as they seem in some of this regards. And that is from the perspective of the characters is information. The characters don't have about their own cultures and they are getting destroyed by the, by the xenomorphs, by the demons. Um, that is the thing. I think when people heard Fox marketed this as a medieval story and it's not medieval is a completely different era. The cultures in this book are largely based on, uh, you know, Sumerians and Greeks and some and Romans and a few other cultures that use a particular uh, military tactic. And it works horribly against the aliens. Basically, the, the population has been ravaged. There's been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who have died. Humanity is hiding in these little hovels because swords don't work against xenomorphs. Everybody who's a lot of the early criticism that came out online were a couple of YouTube posts and a couple of forum posts like, this is ridiculous. No way that knights on horseback could beat uh, xenomorphs. And I'm like, yeah, well, number one, there's no horses. Number two, there's no knights. And number three, you're absolutely correct. There's no way they can beat xenomorphs. And that is the drama of the story is finding out what the characters can do to try and eke out some type of existence. So I'm, I'm hopeful that when uh, the early critics read this, they can see that that I have had the same thoughts they have had. That has all been addressed. I have tried to be very upfront and honest about this. You're not going to have, you know, the, the guy who's killed 72 xenomorphs with his trusted magic sword. Like, that's not in here. That's not in here at all. It's a completely different experience than that. And indeed, I think the reason why it works as a reader from the very beginning is because if anybody is aware of that, it's the characters, right? They're like, they're like, what are we even doing? This is so dangerous. Like we have nothing, yeah. nothing to do. Against the character's these primary these motivation creatures. at all times is uh, stillness is strength. They've got their various mantras and they know full well that if you're in, if you see one of them and they see you, you're dead. It's not, well, maybe we got a shot at it. it, it not, not just dead, but to the point where. You should probably think about killing yourself because that's better for everybody involved. You know, it's it's very dark, hopeless situation. So this is not a swashbuckling, heroic type tale. Right. So before we pivot to listener questions, I, I have one character question I'd like to, to throw out there. Jamie, did you have something you wanted to? No, I was to? just going to say what I don't know. And I don't know if I necessarily want you to tell me this because I think not knowing is always 
uh, part of the mystery. It's part of the mystery mm-hmm. of Alien is that we don't know. But when I was reading the book, I almost felt like this is the Black Plague where you don't know what to do. And yes. these, these people are are dealing with this and they don't know what to do. And there mm-hmm. is nothing to do um, except for be very, very careful. Um, and I was imagining what life was like when the plague was um, sort of decimating cultures. Um, right. Certainly, you know, um, in the UK. And uh, but again, not that that's what your mindset was. And I don't want to know what your mindset was because I don't need a literal translation. Gotcha. But it made me it put me into that space of terror. There's something silent and deadly and there's nothing I can do. It, but I've got there's to figure out what do. to do. There's nothing you can do. And there's there's no explanation for it. Yes. And the people who are telling you what is going on also have no idea. But they're yeah. not letting that on. There are. You know, in, in all cultures at all times in human history, there are charlatans in religion and politics and in leadership and people. There are always people who will take advantage of fear, take advantage of a crisis situation to further their own position in a culture. Mm-hmm. So that is the other part of the Black Plague and of Aliens Phalanx that I tried to play with in the story. Yes. And uh, again, as I was reading, I was thinking about, of course, what's happening right now in the world, which is the coronavirus and uh-huh. th- that the real numbers of death aren't actually being reported, only partial um, because they mm-hmm. don't want to alarm people. And someone who friend of a friend who is in China said the do- the death, the, the number of infected is actually like 90,000 or something like that. I don't nearly know. Wow. But, I was, but then it reminded me as I was reading your book, I was thinking this information is only being disseminated because of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, of course... Again, it, I just was. It was just reminding me of these, 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 uh, these plagues and this terror that uh, you essentially can't run from, but you have to find a way to run from. So, props to you. It, it's, Thank you. It's been great so far. Excellent. Um, speaking of running, I, I, I wanted to bring up just one character who is a runner named Ahalia, mm-hmm. who um, you meet right at the very beginning of this book. And um, and not to give too much away, but but she she's 19 years old, right? She's young, but she's pretty experienced on these runs, which are when uh, small groups of people in this hold are sent on excursions through this wilderness. Uh, to get supplies or to barter or to trade, etc. And uh, and so she's uh, extremely brave, extremely skilled, and um, extremely frustrated by gender dynamics within the hold and all these other things that you know women go through. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she feels right from the beginning like a real person. And I, and I and I a I want to say um, you know great job because I feel Thank like you. it's very easy in in alien uh, writing to come up with characters that just sort of feel like um, you know replicas of Ripley or something. Um, sure. and, and Ahalia never feels like that for a second. And um, and I guess I'm also wondering, how did she kind of reveal herself to you as you were writing her? Are there, are there other characters you took inspiration from? Or where does she sort of come from? She feels so fully fledged. It's uh, One thing I'm always trying to do in my work is take regular people and put them into irregular situations. And I pride myself on trying at all times to make sure that people react like you and I or any listener of the show would react. You know, the whole like, let's split up and go check out the haunted house. That shit don't happen. You know, you're like, then the bad stuff's going on. You you gather around like, let's get the hell out of here. This place is spooky. Let's call the cops. You know, any, any of those things that if your character has to do something that people wouldn't do in order to further your plot, that's when I go back to the drawing board and say, okay, how can I make this work? But you know, there's a, a couple of hallmarks in that are that are fairly standard throughout the aliens, uh, the aliens universe. The first one that I didn't really get maybe the first 50 times I saw aliens and all the other movies is that the aliens really aren't the bad guys. The bad guys is always greedy human beings. Human greed um, is what allows almost all of the plots in the aliens books and movies and the dark horse comics, et cetera, allows them to happen. Cause if humanity just unified and went after this thing and everybody told the truth, we'd wipe the Xen- we'd wipe the xenomorphs out in no time flat, but that never happens. So dealing with the human greed, and getting it into the story. And then, you know, what made this franchise was Sigourney Weaver's two performances and uh, continuing influence in the series and getting that, you know, getting a, the realistic female character in the situation where she's not a Superman like Buffy. You know, she's a regular person who just happens to be the one person in the right place at the right time who step up to do the right thing. So Ahalia largely was that. How can I put someone in this context where... In this culture, women don't have zero power, but they are far, far more under power than men in any other relative position. And try and take that context, which feels 
real in some regards and then see how she reacts when she is put into a position of responsibility. And then even though we're in the middle of this Black Plague-esque type thing going on, people still have hopes and dreams and they still want to get better at things and they still want to accomplish, they still want to go on and have a life. So those are really the the areas that I approached for Mahalia, which is if someone in this situation, you don't just give up living. You don't curl up into a ball and die and you don't spend all of your days trying to avoid getting eaten. There's other stuff that goes on in there too. Finding the right balance of other stuff that goes on to make her feel like, well, this is how I might act if I was in that situation. That's the key to making a realistic character. And that totally comes across. Um, before we wrap, uh, we wanted to get to a couple more listener questions if, if you have a couple yeah, minutes. Yeah, shoot, um, go ahead. Jamie, do you want to do you want to start with Jason's first uh, question? So Jason Romeo Ledger asks, if he writes another book, would it continue on the medieval world he's writing about in Phalanx or would he do something fresh? I think it's already fresh, which I think is funny, but I understand. Thank the you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's doubtful I will write another one. Uh, we have um, a book out called Earthcore, which is available. It's big seller for us on Audible. Um, and it is heavily in James Cameron storytelling influenced. So if you guys listening to this are read through all the alien stuff and you're looking for a pretty, a pretty tight action packed adventure, go check out Earthcore. The sequel for that is called Mount Fitzroy. That's coming out uh, later this year. Um, and we have another book in the Galactic Football League. Book six is coming out along with a novella. That is slated for eight books in that series. And we also have a series called The Crypt, which we're finally getting back to, which is very Aliens-esque in that it's a military SF with some metaphysics thrown in. So we have all of these projects lined up. And it's doubtful I will have time to write another Aliens book for three or four years, more than likely. If I do get to write another one, uh, I've those other four ideas that I presented to Steve are all pretty strong. They're all they're all different. I met two of them. I thought were I was like, holy cow, I've come up with an original idea in the Aliens universe. I'm awesome. And then I start researching. I'm like, oh, Dark Horse did it. You know, <laughs> so a couple of things. I was super bummed. Like, well, buying that comic book because that sounds fantastic. So there's still a, a couple in there that are cool that might push the boundaries of what Fox is willing to do. As I start to get more hardcore into biology and uh, it, they may say no to that. So I, it's not really a good answer for them, but odds are I won't write another one of these for at least four or five years. Our dear friend Clara asked, what's with pumpkins? Uh, he referenced them in Phalanx in his book, Earth Core. And so I want to say yep. that until reading Phalanx, I had never thought about how strange pumpkins are. Because you talk about them as being giant orange fruits larger than human heads. And you know what? They, they're, they're pretty freaking weird. They are really weird. Do you really have a thing weird. for pumpkins? That, uh, well, um, I grew up in a place called Sheboygan, Michigan, and uh, heavily involved in sports. And um, <laughs> small town in northern Michigan, you know, you hated the other sports teams. And of course, everybody's exact, literally exactly like you. It was um, a very homogenous uh, group up there. But we got... We were called pumpkin farmers because we were the the dirty butt poor kids of that area. And we had a lot of tourist towns around us that were much more well off with big old fancy high schools and big old practice facilities and stadiums. And um, we took it sort of as a badge of honor when we would kick their ass in whatever we were playing. Uh, so the the pumpkin has always kind of stuck with me in that regard, which brings up one of the, the I forgot to tell you guys, but one of the funnest parts of writing an aliens book, and you can see the poetry in every author that does it, is how do you describe the xenomorph? And how do you describe the face hugger? And, you know, like Alex's descriptions in, um, in Cold Forge are great. Um, Tim Levin's work is great. Uh, River of Pain, just in, in every time you read a new aliens work, uh, long form fiction, you get that three or four or five paragraphs where the authors describe what they look like. And you can tell it's everybody's badge of honor. Nobody just phones it in. You could phone it in. No problem. Everybody picking up the book knows exactly what they're looking at. But finding the the words to describe that in the way that you want to, uh, to, to, to make it integrate with people is pretty, pretty key. So pumpkins and xenomorphs are things that are fun to describe. And they're both uh, hard and chitinous and threatening. So yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. You throw a pumpkin um, hard enough, it can do some damage for sure. Right, right. And be disgusting inside, of course, much like the alien. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. exactly, exactly. Stacy Ginger Chopskoff, I'm a big fan of Aliens, Stalker. Are you a big fan of the Dark Horse Comics line? If so, which is your favorite arc? Uh, um, there's so much stuff in the Dark Horse line. Uh, it's it's crazy. Um, I think the Red Queen... Um, series was the coolest for me 
um, when I've only recently just, if I, if I have the name right, I've only recently discovered that because that's one of the ideas that I sent to Steve and to Fox. I was like, this would be awesome if we had this kind of thing, this uh, battle for supremacy amongst a genetic deviation within the xenomorphs. And like, yep, Dark Horse did it. So that was uh, from a biological pers- biology perspective. That's my favorite one because I've always been mesmerized by ants and you social organisms. And as a little kid watching in Sheboygan, oddly enough, watching uh, black ants fight red ants uh, and just going to war it was mesmerized by that. I was like, I got to figure out what this is. I got to figure out how all this works. This is amazing. So that that same um, insectile mindless battle for dominance transposed over into the aliens universe was the coolest thing to me. So I think uh, so. I think technically that's uh, aliens genocide. Is that what it the is? title of that of that okay. series? Yeah, which is fucking great. So <laughs> I'm glad that you like it. Yep. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on, Scott. This has just been an absolute pleasure for us, and and we're so lucky to have this new work in our fandom. And uh, and I, I can't wait to have many conversations about this with friends and fans for years to come. And it's it's nice. I feel like with all of the uncertainty around the future of the films, with all of the you know uh, the the uncertainty about the future of the studio, mm-hmm. and all of the vicissitudes of a of a fandom in the social media age, uh, we've been lucky to be consistently getting new works of real art that we can enjoy. And this is yeah. one of them. And this, this is something that I think will have real legs and fandom. So thank you so much for T- contributing it. Titan's yes. working really hard uh, to, to put out good stuff. Um, it's been an uh, awesome experience working with them. And uh, I'll tell your, your listeners right now, this is the time for the write-in campaign. Start emailing Fox and saying, we want to see Phalanx as a movie because it would ah. be the most, it would, for, it would be the least controversial aliens movie because you don't have to deal with the different direction really scott's going in you're not you're not saying anything that happened in the past doesn't works or doesn't work it's so isolated that it can just be this little it could be this little gem and it's uh you know 300 meets xenomorphs it's going to be super fun yeah 300 i like i love it a, a good a good film pitch always needs to be something you could say in an elevator and if you could say yeah. it with 300 meets xenomorphs what more do you need right yep awesome thank you so much for coming on and thanks everyone for listening thanks for having me on the show guys appreciate it For more on Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga podcast, please visit perfectorganism.com. Perfect Organism is available for listen or download through Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and Spotify. If you'd like to support the show, please visit perfectorganism.com forward slash support. Thank you.